regulation after regulation. I think there are outdated regulations that need to be changed. New government regulations, which were created to protect employees. The regulations are... $1.8 trillion. There's a regulation that doesn't make any sense. Why do you keep Is this really the best we can do? Welcome to the Regulatory Transparency Project's fourth branch podcast series. All expressions of opinion are those of the speaker. Good afternoon and welcome to the Federalist Society's fourth branch podcast for the Regulatory Transparency Project. My name is Colton Grob. I'm the deputy director of RTP. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the guest speakers on today's call. If you'd like to learn more about each of our speakers and their work, you can visit regproject.org, where we have their full bios. After opening remarks and discussion between our panelists, we will go to audience Q&A. So please be thinking of the questions you'd like to ask our speakers. This afternoon, we're pleased to host a conversation discussing the recently released CFPB task force report on federal consumer financial law. Our moderator for today's discussion is Brian Johnson. He is a partner at Alston and Bird's Financial Services and Products Group and the financial or the, and the consumer financial services team. Before joining the firm, Brian served as deputy director of the CFPB. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Colton, and welcome uh, listeners uh, to today's podcast. Uh, I'm pleased today to introduce our discussion topic. Recent years have seen a dramatic shift in the way in which American consumers use and shop for financial products and make payments, especially the rapid growth of electronic payments and electronic disclosures. These developments have raised both new opportunities for consumer choice and benefits, but also potential new consumer protection threats. At the same time, repeated economic and financial crises, such as the 2020 global COVID pandemic, have illuminated the tensions in the existing institutional framework and suggested a need for modernization to respond to these challenges. To address these challenges, in 2020, CFPB Director Kathleen Craninger formed the Task Force on Federal Consumer Financial Law to review the existing consumer financial protection framework and to recommend reforms. On January 5th of this year, 2021, the Task Force published its two-volume report and I should say comprises roughly 900 pages. Topics covered by the report and associated recommendations include the history of consumer credit, the supply and demand for consumer credit, small dollar lending, disclosures, competition, innovation, access and inclusion, privacy and data security, and consumer empowerment and financial literacy. Our two panelists today are undoubtedly qualified to discuss all of these topics and more. Todd Zwicky served as the chair of the task force. He is the George Mason University Foundation Professor of Law at George Mason University School of Law. He is also a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, a senior scholar at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and a senior fellow at the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. From 2003 to 2004, Professor Zwicky also served as director of the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. David Silberman served as CFPB's Associate Director for Research, Markets, and Regulations from 2011 when the Bureau first opened its doors until 2020. For two of those years, he also served as Acting Deputy Director. David currently is serving as a Senior Fellow at the Center for Responsible Lending a senior advisor to the Financial Health Network, and an adjunct professor at Georgetown's McCourt School of Public Policy and at Harvard Law School. Todd and David, welcome to you both. I look forward to today's discussion. So let's jump right in. Todd, I'd like to start with you. And uh, I think our audience perhaps would benefit um, from hearing from you about an overview about the task force report itself, the recommendations, how the task force uh, was formed and how you went about your business and what the task force uh, thought about in terms of presentation and the topics uh, to be covered. Uh, I will turn the floor over to you. Thanks, Todd. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And it's uh, it's a real treat uh, to be here with uh, you, Brian and David Silverman, two people who know more about the Bureau probably than anybody uh, in the Bureau's 10 year existence. So I'm very much looking forward to um, to your observations and thoughts. Um, and of course, I want to thank uh, Kathy Cranger, most importantly, for for 
uh, setting up the um, the task force and giving me and trusting me to serve as the chair of the task force, which was um, a, a real treat and uh, and uh, and uh, was an amazing group uh, who who was doing it. And I want to thank Brian, who was in fact the deputy director right when we started and um, was very instrumental in getting it started up and running as well. There were five of us on the task force. It was me, um, Howard Beals, the former. Um, the former head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the Federal Trade Commission when I was at the FTC in the 2000s. Um, Tom Durkin, who's probably the leading consumer credit economist of his generation, was the chief um, consumer credit economist at the Federal Reserve for about uh, 20 or 30 years. Bill McLeod, who was the uh, the head of the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC in the 1980s and has had a very distinguished career as a, both a consumer protection and antitrust lawyer. He also served in the antitrust division at the DOJ. And finally, Jean Noonan, who has uh, years of experience in this area. She was the first um, financial services um, uh lawyer at the Federal Trade Commission when the Division of Credit Practices was set up, later went on to be general counsel of the Farm Credit Administration and has for many years now been in private practice. So it was an unusually uh, diverse um, set of skills that complemented each other very well. And I think one person estimated we had about 150 years of experience altogether. Um, uh, Director Craninger gave us three goals, which was to provide an independent analysis of the current state of the consumer protection system. And I want to thank her and Brian and the other uh, people who are involved who backed us on that um, and really left us uh, independent to do our work. Second, to provide recommendations on how to improve um, the uh, consumer finance and consumer financial protection system. And finally, to do it within one year. Um, and we were set up in January 2020, and um, we reported, uh, we issued our report this year, the first week of January. 2021. So it was actually a federal task force uh, and a federal agency that reported on time. Um, and as Brian said, it was um, a very large uh, report. Volume one basically provides our independent analysis in 13 chapters. Um, uh, that's about 800 pages. And um, Volume two contains 102 recommendations. Um, we basically organized the report around three themes, and I'm going to just spend a few minutes uh, sketching these out and identifying some of the things we hit under each of these themes. Uh, the first was inclusion, um, and this was something that was very important to all of us. The con current consumer financial protection system works, and finance system works pretty darn well for most middle class and upper middle class Americans. We have a wide variety of, uh, it's not perfect all the time, obviously. We all fight with our credit card issuers and the like. But by and large, the system works pretty well. There's a lot of choice, a lot of competition. Um, uh, people want our business, um, and we have a wide variety of, uh, of uh, products and services. But that's not the case for everyone. Um, and we really felt that it was important to try to make sure that the consumer financial protection system and consumer finance system works for all Americans and all Americans are included. And so there's three basic areas that we talk about under that heading. The first is research, uh, which is that we found out that there's a couple places in which there are real pockets of areas um, of financial um, exclusion that we don't know that much about. For example, for, uh, formerly incarcerated populations, it turns out, have a, uh, a terrible time uh, getting access to uh, financial services. Um, if they're in jail for several years, they may not even have a credit report when they emerge. While they are in prison, they are at a very high risk of identity theft. We identify that as a problem uh, in rural populations. Is another uh, group where we know very little, but we know that they are uh, that they have the highest rate of um, credit invisibility. Um, financial exclusion is a real problem for rural populations. It's gotten worse over time, as Dodd Frank and other um, the the regulatory costs of Dodd Frank, as well as other in, uh, developments in the market, have led to closures of uh, a lot of small town banks and rural areas and the like. Um, they also don't have the same access to internet services uh, and high quality internet and the like um, in rural populations. So that's an area in which uh, it's going to take a lot of study and I think uh, research to try to figure out how to deal with um, increasing access of rural populations to financial services. Otherwise, we look at two general areas. The first one 
deals with um, ways in which we can facilitate more inclusion. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities here. The report talks a lot about fintech in particular. Um, the OCC has done a lot of really good work uh, in the past few years in facilitating a f a fintech um, uh, and the opportunities for inclusion. The academic research and policy research on this is very clear that fintech can uh, reach into populations that have previously been underserved and do a lot of good work there. Um, we actually recommend that the CFPB become uh, be authorized to become a chartering authority for fintech chart non-depository fintech charters, and we could talk about that more later if we want. Uh, which is in no way a comment on um, uh, the OCC's operations the past few years, but we just thought it was a way to deal with things going forward. We also uh, like the idea of um, that the FDIC has been promoting more access to industrial loan corporations um, and non-bank, non um, non-traditional bank uh, institutions entering into financial services. We think the real poster boy here is Walmart, who about 10 years ago wanted to enter the banking industry, but was blocked by incumbent banks um, at the FDIC, especially community banks who didn't want the competition. But, uh, but where Walmart has entered um, the markets, they've really shaken up the status quo and driven down price and increased um, uh, opportunities for consumers. And we think that there are more opportunities for that and that the, um, the FDIC has moved in that direction in recent years and should continue to do so. Um, we also uh, argue for greater portability of bank accounts. Um, and we could talk more about that, but the bank account competition is uh, not as good as other markets. The bank accounts are very sticky for consumers. And we come up with the idea, um, and it's been tried in other countries, that um, allow so-called open banking. Um, and certain uh, uh, developments have made open banking more possible here, but they're kind of workarounds. But we think that is a good way of empowering consumers to be able to get more competition in bank accounts. Um, we also um, are very bullish, um, and the CFPB itself has been very bullish on greater use of alternative data uh, beyond the traditional um, sort of uh, criteria that um, um, deal with that uh, that deal with credit um, that go into a FICO score. Things like cash flow data, reporting of things like utilities and rent and the like. Um, we heard from some members of industry that they thought that that uh, that they weren't sure about the regulatory environment for that. So we call on that for some clarification. We also think that credit unions. Um, should be able to uh, uh, broaden their base and the credit unions that serve lower income populations should also become uh, easier to, uh, to charter. And we also look at faster payments. And the Fed, for whatever reason, has dragged its feet for years um, in creating faster payments uh, and check clearing, which we think would help consumers. We A, a second category, a third category we look at are areas of where we can eliminate or, or reform or amend statutes that we think have unintended consequences. The Durban Amendment obviously being one which has led to higher bank fees, um, especially for low-income consumers, but also various aspects of the CARD Act. Um, uh, such as for college students. And the CARD Act um, makes it difficult for college students to get credit cards. But what we've seen is that this isn't uniform, which is for, for wealthier, for kids from wealthier backgrounds, higher income backgrounds, their parents can just co-sign and get them a credit card, where for kids from lower income backgrounds, um, they, they, they can't co-sign. They're basically left without a credit card. And what we know is that when the credit cards are usually the first way people establish credit, um, and if you don't have credit when you're young, you're less likely to have credit when you're, you're older. The second category after inclusion we look at is focusing consumer financial protection on consumer harm. Um, disclosure has been the primary focus of consumer financial protection um, for many years now. And and while disclosure is a very good thing that can facilitate shopping, it can also be too much of a good thing. Um, and so what we uh, point to is trying to use disclosure more readily um, in a more tailored manner. Um, so that uh, consumers get access to the information they need, but otherwise focusing on consumer harm and misuse of data and uh, uh, the like with consumers rather than, um, uh, rather than mere disclosure. 
uh, we and we also have a variety of other things that we do, such as making enforcement more pred uh, predictable, such as by adopting the FFIEC uh, schedule or um, a guidance for penalties, um, and tying enforcement more closely to consumer harm. The third area we talk about is modernization, and I will wrap up on this, which is that um, that. The, the pandemic, which you know, the, the, which has been a horrible thing, um, sort of highlighted to us as we were doing the task force, um, the, the, there was already a, a recognition of the need to modernize the consumer financial protection system, as Brian said, to take a to take account of changes in technology and consumer preferences and the like. Uh, the pandemic basically highlighted that, which is we've basically seen ten or fifteen years of development squeezed into six months in terms of. A adoption of electronic payments. And what we saw was that created havoc uh, for the traditional system. A lot of states, for example, still required in-person real estate closings or in-person um, uh, real estate uh, um, appraisals. Um, and we thought there needs to be a way for, for the financial protection regulated to cut through those sort of state laws, especially where those laws reflect special interest activity more than anything else. We also talked about uh, the idea of using more um, rule, uh, um, um, uh, principles-based regulation instead of prescriptive rules-based regulation uh, that would allow the system to evolve uh, as technology and consumer preferences uh, develop. Um, and that would be new for the, uh, for the, for, uh, for the financial, uh, financial system, which is very heavily predicated right now on prescriptive uh, regulation. So we could come back to all of these ideas um, as we develop but I'd like to hear uh, from David now. Thanks. Thank you, Todd. Uh, and I will turn this over to David. David, um, you know, when we work together, I was a great admirer of your intellect and in particular, your capacity to absorb huge amounts of information as the head of the, the rulemaking uh, division within CFPB. So uh, there is no, perhaps nobody better suited based off of your experience and interest and capabilities to uh, absorb this entire uh, report and recommendations and offer, um, uh, I think, some wisdom uh, and, and great observations. In, in particular, I'd love to hear a little bit about your perspective um, on the report, having uh, you know been at the Bureau over the greater part of the past decade and seeing the Bureau, the agency grow from uh, an upstart into the agency that it is today. So we'd love to, um, hear from you a bit on, uh, you know, areas where you may uh, agree, areas where there may be disagreement, um, maybe some topics not addressed that you think are front and center as part of uh, the Bureau's mission or uh, other areas not covered fully. So with that, I will uh, turn it over for, to you and, uh, you know, greatly appreciate your observations. Thanks. thanks, Brian. Thanks for the kind words. It was great having the opportunity to work with you and thanks uh, the Federal Society for inviting me to uh, I guess I started, I couldn't help as I was preparing today's session uh, to recall a, a story that my, one of my former law partners told me about his first oral argument. Uh, it was in the Fifth Circuit, and his co one of the leaders of the Alabama, in the Alabama bar at the time. And so he brought my colleague in and introduced him to the chief judge before the argument started. And my colleague reported when he got up to argue, the chief judge looked down at him and said, uh, Mr. Gottesman, uh, we understand this is your first argument. We just want you to know that there's nothing you're going to be able to say today that's going to be able to persuade us of the merits of your client's position. Uh, we just, but we're going to very much enjoy listening to you try. Uh, so I'm not naive enough to think that I'm going to persuade very many people today, but I hope you'll at least enjoy the, the conversation. And let me sort of, I want to take it up a level and sort of start with some I look forward to having the opportunity to talk about the, the three themes that Todd laid out and some of the specifics, uh, some of which I agree with, some of which I, I don't agree with. But let me take it off a level and offer sort of three more general observations. I mean, the first, obviously, is, what it, is to express admiration for just the volume of work that the task force was able to accomplish and the time it was able to, to accomplish it. Uh, the task force was modeled after a commission the Commission on Consumer Finance in the 1960s, but that and that commission had 20 staff, 10 consultants, a whole bunch of student research assistants. It was focusing on a narrow area of consumer finance, and the task force was uh, 
it took three years to do its work and produced a report about half the length of the report that this commission, this task force had produced. Although the task force, uh, the commission in 68 did, or in 72 did produce uh, volumes of staff reports as well. Uh, so just the amount of work that the task force was able to be accomplished, uh, was able to accomplish in this period of time is breathtaking. Having said that, the second point that I would make is that from my perspective, the structure and processes here are flawed in ways that affect the utility of what the task force came up with and the, the series of how it'll be utilized. And again, if I draw a contrast with the commission on which this task force was entitled, the commission was a bipartisan body representing a fairly wide range of views uh, initially chaired by Professor Broucher at Harvard, who was at that time the uh, 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 was a reporter for the restatement of contracts. Uh, then when he became a justice, uh, he was replaced by uh, Attorney Mil uh, Ray Milstein. Uh, the, task, the commission held six days hearings and heard from uh, 100 or more witnesses. Uh, this task force, in contrast, uh, I think it's fair to say ran an ideological spectrum closer from A to B than A to Z. Uh, I have enormous respect for the members of the task force, uh, for Howard and uh, Tom, the econ as economists and for the attorneys, but they are of a particular place on the uh, political ideological spectrum, if you will. There have been public reports that academics who held different views applied to be members of the task force and were not uh, because of their views. And so I think that created a a, a task force whose processy who's uh, with serious problems with the what with the constitution and therefore the the outcomes. Uh, I'd be quite frankly I can't imagine what the we would have heard if when Director Cordray was director of the uh, CFPB he had created a task force drawn entirely from one part of the ideological spectrum made those uh, folks employees not had, had a process uh, subject to the Federal Advisory Committee Act, I think there would have been a real outpouring of uh, outrage over that process, and I think with good reason. So I think the process here is problematic. Uh, and the result is a report which, from my perspective, is quite imbalanced in the set of recommendations. Obviously, the themes that Todd outlined are themes with which I think everybody could have, can agree that inclusion is should be certainly an important goal to pursue. That there is a need for modernization. I think many some of the recommendations make a deal of sense, uh, and that focusing on harm is uh, hard to object object to to that. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense. Again, if we contrast what the task force came up with what the commission came up, up with uh, back in, in its day. The commission did make some recommendations which the task force highlighted to improve competition, uh, but it also made a number of recommendations to enhance consumer rights, to impose new duties on creditors, uh, and recommendations to enhance supervision and enforcement, including interestingly, a recommendation for quote, a federal watchdog agency with full statutory authority to issue rules and regulations and supervise all examination enforcement functions under the Consumer Credit Protection Act. So in many ways, the commission anticipated or its recommendations were the precursor of the creation of the CFPB, uh, for which uh, Senator Warren is typically given credit. The task force recommendations, in contrast, are quite different. They are uh, there are a lot of recommendations for new re for new research, many of which are interesting ideas. There's some addressed to the CFPB internal organization and structure and processes. Uh, we could get into those if anybody's interested. I tend to disagree with those in general. Uh, but there's about 30 or so recommendations by my count that are in the nature of calls for substantive changes in the law or clarifications of the law. And they're almost entirely of uh, deregulatory nature, uh, relaxing prohibitions, clarifying permissions uh, as the, the way to achieve the, the goals that Todd has set out. And so at the highest level, I would say that it's 
not my view from my experience that substantially all the problems facing consumers or all the tools to achieve inclusion uh, or to address change are in the nature of reducing re regulation and freeing up the competition. The task talks about uh, a framework using actually a speech that Brian gave when he was at the pro talks about the framework con consumer protection resting on th a three-legged stool. That's three, the three legs being competition, the law of private contract, and regulation or policing of the market. And my overall perspective is that task force recommendations would cut one of those legs, the last of those legs, rather short and create an imbalanced stool. Uh, from my perspective, there are a number of areas where markets, as they exist, there's a misalignment of interests between the providers of consumer financial product services and consumers where more regulation is needed. There are markets where the competitive forces have led to an equilibrium in which those least able to bear the cost of the consumer financial services are subsidizing people like me uh, who don't need those subsidies. Uh, there's markets where regulation is not kept pace actual change, and I think there's a need to uh, enhance regulation in light of what new technologies allow. Uh, and I would say that we've created for the in large extent, a system, a legal system with lots of consumer rights, but we have neutered the system of private enforcement that was established to enforce those rights without funding public enforcement in a way sufficient to enforce those rights. And that's, a, I think, a large gap in the consumer finance system that the uh, task force doesn't talk about. So with that sort of high level, let me stop and I look forward to the conversation about the specific topics Tops Todd laid out and some of the more more specifics. Thank you, David. That uh, I think goes a long way towards helping set it set up some of the uh, difference of opinion here inherent, not just between maybe yourself and the the task force view, but uh, difference of opinion that have been longstanding now for um, 50 years and, and perhaps longer in terms of the approach to uh, consumer protection and uh, the role of federal agencies like the CFPB. So, um, Todd, let me uh, go back to you um, and let me pivot for a second and do a bit of a deeper dive on one of the themes of the report uh, that you already alluded to. Um, and actually, I was surprised to to read and, and in fact hear from you that uh, you know if this is uh, in fact a deregulatory type of report that there was. Uh, a, a recommendation for uh, even more authority for the CFPB in the in the role of now being a, a chartering authority for fintech. But I, I view that really as um, you know one aspect of the broader debate that um, you know advocates across the spectrum have about uh, financial access and inclusion. And um, I was struck at uh, how the report did uh, some deep dives into aspects of that. And of course, you know, the, one of the top priorities for the CFPB now with uh, Acting Director Weigio is, um, is racial equity. Uh, and certainly the Bureau has uh, authority to enforce non-discrimination statutes, HAMDA, uh, ECOA, um, Reg B, and, and soon uh, the Section 1071 Small Business Lending uh, Rule. Um, so, you know, the principle of non-discrimination and policing markets to uh, free market participants and consumers from uh, discrimination is is one aspect of promoting financial access inclusion, but also Todd, you touched on um, another aspect, which is uh, the promotion of um, of innovation in the marketplace uh, to uh, help address uh, some of the uh, problems observed by bureau researchers and others about uh, credit invisibles or folks who uh, are not uh, currently participants in the mainstream um, banking or financial system. Would love to. Hear your thoughts, Todd, on um, how the task force uh, thought about those issues and importantly, how it addressed them and what recommendations it made in that regard. Thanks, Brian. And um, and that's obviously an issue that everybody cares about always um, and um, especially nowadays. So I'll say, say, I'll say a few things, um, which is first, there are some things really under the heading of mo regulatory modernization that also fit with this. So for example, 
we um, recommend that Congress consider or at least study the, uh, the, uh, the benefits and the cost of adding disability to ECOA. Uh, it's obvious that social norms have changed and the Americans with Disability Act um, uh, obviously um, covers some of that, but, uh, but the testimony we got and the research we did suggested that there might still be issues involving uh, disability um, in ECOA. So, we, uh, so one of the areas in which we call for uh, congressional exploration and possible uh, action would be to include uh, disability. There are some things also that um, are, might be accurately um, considered to be deregulatory, but we thought were appropriate just in terms of modernization. So, for example, um, Gene Noonan pointed out um, there's a there's a whole market now of technologies that didn't exist in the 70s involving assisted reproductive um, technologies. Um, and ECOA prohibits a lender from asking somebody what their childbearing plans are. Well, obviously, if you're a woman who wants to go in and get a, uh, a uh, to finance one of these expensive IVF or other procedures, um, there's it's kind of natural to ask whether or not you're planning on using it uh, for childbearing uh, uh, plans. And so some of this is things like that, that uh, archaic rules that um, uh, maybe have served their function or, have, uh, or are no longer relevant, such as that one, and some of the other issues involving uh, um, women um, and discrimination against women on, on the basis of gender are things that you know, I guess could accurately be considered uh, um, uh, uh, deregulatory, but which seem like pretty uh, uh, obvious cases in which um, the, the, the continued benefits seem small relative to the cost of things like that, or asking about phones and their own name and things like that. So that so that's a group of things that I think are you know directly relevant to this. Um, a second area uh, that uh, is that's that's relevant on this whole question um, relates to um, as you said fin. Uh, sort of uh, competition and the like. And so, as we looked at this, one of the things we saw is that the evidence, um, obviously, fintech um, raises all sorts of potential cost and benefits. But one area in which fintech seems to be particularly have particular potential is um, to break down um, the disparities in pricing. Uh, and we really go through the evidence here. Um, and there's a lot of evidence, particularly some great studies by some economists at the Philadelphia Federal Reserve who find that fintech and entry into the market by fintech uh, providers tends to reduce uh, disparities in pricing on the basis of, um, of race. Um, the other thing that we flag, and this may be an area I'm, I'm sure that David would uh, would disagree, but, um, but and, and they would disagree with our recommendations, but at least on some things such as the CARD Act, as I mentioned on the outset, I think our, you know, really where the task force comes down is says, look, the way that some of these things are implemented right now clearly has costs and unintended consequences, and maybe the benefits exceed the costs. But it'd be at least worth revisiting the question to see whether or not we could get whatever benefits we want um, at lower costs. So I gave the example of college students. But another example is subprime credit cards. Um, and one of the things we see in the CFPB's report on credit invisibles um, is that, as I said earlier, credit cards are the way in which most people first get access to credit. Uh, the second thing we see in that report is that when you are credit in, when you are credit invisible, you tend to stay credit invisible. Um, and traditionally, a way in which people would become credit visible would be through an unsecured subprime credit cards and card. And that has largely disappeared from the market. And it's not really clear what is uh, sprung up to replace it. And a lot of the things that consumers have turned to, consumers in that situation, are not very attractive options either, such as payday loans and the like, which also have the additional effect that they don't really help the people to establish credit. So there are these trade-offs, especially with um, immigrants, young people, um, people who have impaired credit, um, all these uh, uh, who have these challenges. It's kind of a chicken and the egg problem involving becoming credit visible and being able to get access to mainstream credit. And it may be that um, people would disagree with our uh, conclusions, which is perfectly reasonable as to what should be done. But we hope at least that people will take the empirical evidence seriously and be sort of look at the potential unintended consequences of this and really put good thought into how to get the benefits of some of these regulations uh, without the, uh, the unintended consequences and costs. Thanks, Todd. And David, I'll turn it back to you. Um, still on the topic of financial access inclusion, you obviously have 
the long view and were a thought leader, senior leader within the Bureau uh, who you know, wrestled for years um, with this issue in terms of what the Bureau's priorities should be, how it should be addressing these issues. Is there anything you care to share about the Bureau's approach, which may be represented or not represented in the task force report? In other words, does the report recommendations represent a departure from the status quo um, or simply a different area of emphasis? Love to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Brent. Uh, so I hadn't thought about the question of how these the, the task force recommendations compare to the CFPB approach. It starts by saying, you know, as Todd said, we agree that inclusion is a key goal, equity is a key goal. They're not one and the same. One can have an inclusive system. It's not equitable, of course, but they're both important goals. I think, you know, I I think the recommendation, if we so one aspect of inclusion is we know that there is a significant uh, segment of people who are unbanked, don't have any any checking, don't have a checking account. Uh, that's come down significantly over the past ten years. Uh, but there's still a, still an issue. I think open banking is a great idea. It might help some there, although I would doubt it's going to help very much. FinTech has made a difference, and encouraging that makes sense. But ultimately, we're now talking about a population, about half of the people uh, who are unbanked earn less than 15000 a year. Three quarters earn less than 30000 a year in household income. My own sense. We're going to address this problem. It's going to require some form of either the government as a provider of last resort or subsidies. And the task force report talks a little about it, but there's no recommendation. But I don't think we're going to solve that problem through a more competitive marketplace. When it comes to credit invisibles that Todd talked about, uh, uh, there is, I mean, it, there is, not, or data indicates there is a significant segment of people who do not have a credit any credit report. Uh, I quite disagree with Todd in suggesting that once you're invisible, you stay invisible. Uh, as one of my colleagues used to say, nobody's born with a credit report or a credit score. You get a birth certificate. Uh, and substantial, most people have one. So that this does change over time. I don't think it's true that the way into credit visibility was at any time uh, subprime credit card type that the Card Act restricts, which is to say those where the upfront fee is more than 25% of the credit line. That was a product offered by one, only one issuer. Uh, mainstream credit cards, such as the ones offered by Capital One, have never been affected. Had those kinds of features, they're not affected by the Card Act. I think if you're going to deal with the problem of invisibility, uh, I agree with Todd that, and the task force that alternative data is an important place to look. But here I would say that, you know, uh, so type of alternative data is transactional data, that is data for checking accounts. My perspective, the biggest obstacle for that development is that it's not in the interest of the bank to allow others to access the data. And there's a need for, Dodd Frank Act has a provision which is never really paid for in to assure that data can be accessible. Uh, another promising data which task force talks about is transactional data. Todd mentioned utility payments, telecom payments is a particularly promising such a large percentage of people have mobile phones these days. That data is not available largely because it's not in the interest of the telecom providers to make it available. They've created their own system that they can get the benefits of credit reporting without being reporters. And then they can, if an account goes uh, delinquent, they can turn it over to a debt collector and the debt collector then reports the lines so that they get the benefit of negative reporting, but no positive reporting. So it's another area where I think if you want to deal with the issue, you need to think about more regular and taking a, at least fitting sort of negatively reporting and perhaps mandating reporting in order to expand, uh, expand access and inclusive, inclusivity. Uh, so let me stop at that point. Thanks, David. Let me um, let me turn to another topic, which I, I think is a general theme throughout the report. And certainly, there are a, a number of areas we could discuss. But one the one I wanted to focus on is is small dollar credit. And I think the main theme is, you know, to David David, your point. I think everybody can agree that you know the purpose of the bureau or of federal consumer financial law generally is to prevent consumer harm. Um, but there are areas of of you know, strong policy disagreement, which we've seen play out, for instance, in the Cordray era versus the uh, Mulvaney-Craninger era. 
And I think, uh, you know, payday lending or small dollar credit is one of those areas where the, the differences in thinking, um, you know, uh, are most stark. Todd, um, in the report, uh, the task force did address small dollar credit. Um, so we'd love to hear from you about how the task force thought about uh, small dollar uh, lending um, from a consumer protection uh, or prevention of consumer harm perspective. Uh, thanks, Brian. And obviously that is a, a, a big issue and one we talked a lot about. And the point we make in chapter five is this is a perennial issue. Uh, this is an issue to which there is really no solution and only trade-offs, and there always has been. Um, and if you look back at um, U.S. history, um, you, you can see this. And the basic problem, there's that, there's that old joke about, um, you know, when you have like construction, you, you can pick um, cheap, uh, fast, or good, pick two. And that's sort of the case when it comes to small dollar lending, uh, which is that you can, the, the fundamental problem is that the cost of making loans does not scale to the size of the loan. Um, and so in terms of dollar cost, so a $300 loan costs a $3,000 loan does not cost 10 times more to make than a $300 loan, and a $30,000 loan doesn't cost uh, what uh, um, 100 times more than a $300 loan or whatever the, uh, the, the math would be. Um, and so, if you want to have small dollar loans, it is going to be expensive. Um, the second thing is, is that these small dollar loans uh, tend to have very high risk. Um, they have high default rates. Um, and so, the reality is, is that small dollar loans are, in terms of measured APR and the like, are going to be expensive. Um, the task force as the NCCF uh, itself did, takes no position on the moral question um, as to whether or not um, a loan of a, above a certain cost should not be allowed to be made. Uh, basically, what we say is that the evidence suggests that um, the usury ceilings, uh, in particular, can be used to get rid of the uh, to get rid of um, the supply of a small dollar loan product, but it doesn't get rid of the demand. And when you try to get rid of the demand, what that ends up doing is pushing consumers to other um, other things. Historically, for example, uh, it caused consumers to rely very heavily on. Uh, retail store credit um, uh, and loan sharks. Um, loan sharking in the United States used to be a big to be a big issue. Um, to give you a, a sense of the problem, in the 1960s, the best estimate I've been able to find is that loan sharking, all loan sharking in the United States, was about a $10 billion industry, which, to give you a translation, is about $69 billion in today's dollars, which is about double the size of the entire payday loan market in the United States uh, uh, today. So. When we didn't have small dollar lending, when it was Ill illegal, um, loan sharks proliferated, which isn't to say that would be the case um, uh, today. But if you get rid of the supply, you don't get rid of the, the demand. Um, and that's basically where we come down on, is basically saying there are trade-offs here. Uh, the second thing we point to is that it's not really clear, um, uh, you know, a, a particular concern has been so-called debt traps. And it's not really clear what the what's meant by that, uh, which is to say that what we know is that a lot of consumers roll over their um, their uh, their payday loans. Uh, the evidence suggests uh, quite clearly that on average, most consumers who roll over their payday loans um, a no, are, are expecting to do so. New research by John Zinman and his co-authors finds that um, consumers are actually better than uh, than sort of experts, uh, academics and the like, at predicting their likelihood of rolling over their consumer loans. So they they don't seem to suffer very much from this over optimism uh, problem that people are concerned about. And we don't really know why they why they roll over their loans. The idea seems to be that something terrible will happen to them if they default. But it's not ever really been specified as to what that is. And so they don't seem to be deterred from rolling over their loans. The, the default rate is obviously very high, which means a lot of people don't actually uh, default. And so I think if that's the particular concern, um, we'd want to uh, try to figure out um, exactly. There, there's more research that would need to be done, I think, to understand what's uh, going on with that. Um, and, uh, and and so there's so there's a lot of assumptions about small dollar loans, um, and why consumers use them, how they use them. But there's a lot of open questions um, as to whether or not all those assumptions are correct. Correct.
Thanks, Todd. David, let me uh, give you the floor to respond. You're obviously no stranger to um, the Bureau's approach uh, in this area, both from a market research uh, and economic research perspective, but also, you know, the Bureau has been active, as you know, in, in uh, writing uh, rules uh, covering this space. We'd love to hear your thoughts on, on what Todd has shared or uh, any observations you have about how the task force uh, tackled the topic. Sure. So let me start with, I mean, I, I agree with, uh, I guess, perhaps be surprised, I agree with much of what Todd said. I mean, it is certainly the truth that co the cost of making loans don't scale, that small dollar loans are going to be riskier loans, and that they are going to be more expensive. I think there's no denying that. Uh, there is this question, of whether it's a moral question, or as to what, at what point would you want to try and have regulations so that uh, a lender's interests are more or less aligned with the consumers rather than this business works no matter how high the defaults go. Uh, and that I think is a fundamental moral policy question, uh, which the Bureau, because it doesn't have usury, the ability to regulate rates didn't have to get into. Uh, I guess the places where I would disagree with Todd is either getting rid of supply doesn't get rid of demand, uh, at least to some extent. We do not know, for example, there are 20, 20 states plus or minus which do not have payday lending at all. The evidence that I know of, maybe more research be done, that loan sharking is more is more prevalent there than it is in, uh, in, other, in states which allow payday lending. The data seems to be that internet, although there's internet payday lending to some extent, it's no, it doesn't seem to take with a place with a greater prevalence in a state where there's not payday storefront payday lending. Uh, we know from other credit markets that supply seems to stimulate demand, that as credit lines increase in credit cards, for example, people who had uh, met plenty of open to buy on their existing credit cards will increase their debt because they've been given more credit. So I think this is a, an open question, not a clear question. Uh, the other area where I disagree with Todd is with respect to the extent to which consumers who take out these loans understand what are the likely consequences. Uh, the Zinman research to which he referred, all that it says is a sample of people who had been in debt for a period of time when asked, is there what is the likelihood they're going to take out at least one more loan within 45 days? They were fairly good at predicting that, although those who were had the least amount of experience were least good at predicting that. So the, the research doesn't suggest that people understand how what's going to happen I think the evidence from Ronald Mann's study is quite clear that there that the folks who wound now well, I get I get much sample, but the folks who wound up in long periods of indebtedness had no idea ex ante that that was going to be their likely outcome. So whether you know the bureau took a, took the bureau given its tools that to say the approach was to try and assert an ability to repay, but to create require create some exceptions for to allow certain loans. Uh, other states have simply capped the number of loans. Other states have created cooling off periods. I think there is a need to try and do something to prevent help prevent this phenomenon of consumers taking out a loan, not realizing what the likely outcome is going to be, and ending up uh, paying uh, $300 to borrow $300 and in 14 weeks still owing $300, which is not an uncommon result within the payday loan market. Thanks, David. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll open this up to, to questions, but I did have one follow-on question on this, which is um, you know, a fascinating aspect of consumer credit regulation generally, which is, David, you, you pointed out that some 18-plus states have simply prohibited the type of short-term small-dollar lending that's typically known as, uh, as payday lending. Others have uh, regulated that form of lending. So, the, the question, uh, which I think is somewhat obvious for, for both of you, is uh, it's one thing to identify the need for regulation. The, it's a second question is who should regulate? Uh, and it's unclear that any state lacks the capacity to regulate. So what, um, what are your, uh, both of your collective thoughts on who should regulate in this space? And, and uh, to the extent that there's a role for federal regulation, what is that role? David, why don't you go first this time? Sure. So I, I guess, Brian, that's really a question on philosophy as to what the appropriate role of the federal government is vis the state government. It's not a question unique in any way to the area of consumer finance uh, and to what extent one wants to have uh, 
of, fe of federal federal standards. I guess having been a federal regulator and having been tasked by given the authority by Congress to establish national standards, I uh, and in a world in which that is sort of the norm is that most state law in this area is follow on to federal law rather than uh, I'm not in small dollar, but it, it, consumer finance generally. It was Congress who enacted TILA, then states uh, enacted many truth and lending acts. Congress enacted Fair Debt Collection Practice Acts and state followed. So I tend to take as a given that this is that having federal standards makes uh, makes sense. But I, I mean, that really depends on whether one believes that sort of uh, what the role of the federal government should be vis-a-vis -vis the state governments. Yeah, I would I would agree with that, and I would add one more thought, which is um, David mentioned the NCCF, and the NCCF was sort of the um, the second wave of financial regulatory modernization. Uh, the first one was in the 1920s. Um, this is when we sort of first had consumer credit become a big thing when people moved into the cities from the farms and immigrants came in and they needed credit for the first time, um, and there was a need to to um, to update and amend consumer credit credit laws to uh, provide access uh, for, for small dollar loans for um, for wage earners. And then really what happened in the 1970s was in that intervening period, we saw the rise of a, of a national consumer finance market, whether it was the department stores who operated, um, who there were a lot of mergers and national department store chains where they operated their credit operations out of a central office uh, that m created a need for federal regulation or simple things like declining cost of telephone services, uh, which caused um, which caused uh, uh, made it easier to be able to collect debts across state lines. And, and that's one of the reasons why we saw the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and the like was because states weren't really able to get at uh, a lot of unfair debt collection practices. Um, uh, and that brings us up to the, the current era, which is the internet, which isn't just national, obviously. It's kind of nowhere and everywhere. Um, the, the CFPB is unusually well positioned um, to, to, deal with the, uh, to deal with that, right? It has the kind of reach that the states uh, don't have. And, and so one of the reasons why, for example, we suggest the CFPB would be a good chartering authority for, uh, for non-depository fintech and institutions is precisely because the traditional safety and soundness issues aren't as important with respect to those entities, but the consumer protection issues really are in the in the CFPB potentially has the reach to do that. In addition, we're, we're concerned that uh, the big banks um, might be able to strong arm the OCC into imposing unnecessary um, barriers to entry on fintech companies, such as unnecessary capital requirements and the like. But that is the way of framing your question, Brian, which is, I think the larger question is, what does competition look like in this market uh, to the extent that payday loans, for example, compete against fintech and compete against uh, bank-issued um, overdraft protection and these variety of things that are national, internet, state and local, um, I think a prudential question and sort of common sense and not banking prudential, but a common sense question could be asked, which is how do we best draw the jurisdictional boundaries, uh, understanding that from the consumer perspective, payday loans aren't don't operate in a local market. They also operate in a market in which payday loans compete against uh, internet uh, payday loans. And and what the and so there's actually sort of an interesting question to determine what the federal state balance should be that will best not only that will facilitate consumer choice and consumer protection, and not just think of it as a question of sort of traditional states' rights, uh, um, federalism, sovereignty, but think about federalism through the lens of 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 promoting competition that benefits consumers. Thanks, Todd. In the interest of time, uh, I think I'll turn this over to Colton for audience questions if, if anybody wants to chime in. Of course, we've only scratched the surface, both of the report itself and the topics that the report represents more generally. So we'd love to have more time. Unfortunately, uh, time is running short, but um, do want to provide the opportunity for uh, audience participation here and, and ask questions of our panelists. Um, failing any questions, I, of course, have many more uh, to address those uh, uh, until we're at the top of the hour. Thanks. Thanks, Brian. Let's now go to audience Q&A. We'll go to the first one now. Yes. Hi, this is uh, Chris Mafarage, and my question is for both of the panelists. Um, but in particular, David, you brought up uh, 
the man study and how it relates to uh, payday lending. So I was curious if uh, you two could talk a bit more about what the man study says in its relationship to the original payday rule. David, I'll let you uh, go first on that since you were more involved. Sure. So uh, this is a study by Ronald Mann, uh, where uh, a very high quality study where he actually uh, got it, was able to link uh, survey data, ask people before they took out a loan how long they expected to be, to be in debt, and then link that with administrative data. He found that on average, people were predicted reasonably well within one or two, I think two or three weeks, uh, but that there was that on average, uh, there was a tale of people who had substantial sequences of debt and that none of them predicted that. Uh, when our economists tried to draw a, see if the correlation, there was a correlation of close to zero between predictions and length of indebtedness. Uh, and when they reviewed that with uh, Professor Mann, he agreed that there did not seem to be any correlation between their predictions and length of indebtedness. And there's and I'll, I'll, and and I'll, I'll just add a, f a few words on that, which is the first is that um, it is clear that um, consumers don't always accurately predict. But what man generally found was that on average, um, consumers correctly predicted in the in the fashion that David uh, described, but also that errors tended to be unbiased, um, which is to say that uh, for those who made errors, they on average were just as likely to pay back the loan earlier than they expected as opposed to later uh, than they expect. And, and ironically, this one study that was done on um, auto title lending found the same thing, even though the uh, authors um, didn't didn't uh, appreciate it. Um, and so and so that's and so there is a bit of a, a dueling interpretation um, question here. The the other thing that was interesting about the payday loan rule was that the CFPB focused on sort of the number of loans um, and really the question of consumers that take up uh, uh, above six loans to put it, it's more complicated than that, but basically six loans in a, uh, in, in a given year. And then kind of go beneath that. Uh, I've got a paper um, that I'm finishing with uh, the economist Tom Miller, where we find, for example, that one of the, the things that predicts um, uh, the number of loans that somebody takes is whether a given state limits how much you can borrow at any given time. So that states that have low loan caps, where you can only borrow like $500 at a time, Time, consumers take out more loans, um, uh, and in the end, by and large, uh, end up borrowing the uh, the same amount of money. And so, the the CFPB, because as David said, doesn't have um, authority to impose usury ceilings, instead tried to get at this particular problem of consumers taking out more uh, more loans than uh, taking out a lot of loans or roll over the loans. And um, I think still there are questions um, that if that is revisited, I think that there are questions that need to be asked about why consumers do that, what causes that, uh, and, and the like, um, uh, in addition to the questions about the man study. Thanks, Todd. Thanks, David. As we approach the top of the hour, I'd like to uh, throw out again um, another request for questions, if anyone has them. Seeing none. Uh, well, not Brian? Yet. This is Brian. Uh, yeah. I'm going to squeeze one more in this last minute that we have, um, and then uh, thank the panelists and turn it over to them for uh, any closing thoughts they have. Um, so it, it's not lost on anybody that we're uh, now under new management at the CFPB. Um, Rohit Chopra has his nomination hearing before Senate Banking Committee next week. Presumably, confirmation means the next uh, confirmed director takes over with new priorities. Um, David, unique to you, you've seen kind of a long view and you know, lived through the first major leadership transition for the Bureau. Uh, now there will be another one, which we'll observe from the outside. Todd, you've also seen you know, how the FTC uh, handles things and how that may have, um, that experience for Mr. Chopra may have um, influenced maybe the way he thinks about some of these issues. But I guess the general question I have is, the way the Bureau is designed essentially begs for these types of policy shifts and the pendulum swing, depending on which party is in the White House and who therefore uh, can be confirmed into the director role. From a, from a big picture perspective, again, seeing how things have played out over the last 10 years, does, does that pendulum swing back and forth serve the interests of consumers? Does it serve the interests of markets? Does it uh, help the stability of the agency itself? I know that's 
uh, in some sense, a, a loaded question, but in, in another sense is really the big picture question here, which is how do folks prepare for whether a, a consumer operating in a market or market participants, be them financial institutions, how do you prepare for the inherent uncertainty of the political process? And is that a problem or is that uh, you know a feature of the system um, that uh, is, is both natural and, and ultimately beneficial uh, for consumers and markets? Um, well, th thanks for that question, uh, Brian. And I think, I mean, obviously there there are costs associated with uh, with changes in in direction uh, from time to time. I also have a fear that the costs are not necessarily uh, borne equally by all uh, all members of industry or consumers. Which is to say, I suspect that big swings in policy tend to probably favor the big banks uh, who have the the resources uh, and the ability to hire you know armies of lawyers and consultants and the like to be able to adjust to changes over time, whereas smaller firms and the like, um, I, th I think, are disadvantaged uh, potentially uh, by that. Um, and, you know, consumers, upper income consumers probably have a uh, ability to buffer those changes more easily. Um, uh, through uh, through just our uh, the resources uh, that we have, I think with respect to uh, p to potential, assuming a um, uh, coach Chopra um, Rohit is uh, confirmed, Director Chopra, I think one thing that'll be interesting to watch is coming from the FTC. How does that influence his experience? Um, the CFPB, we note in the report, is seems to be unique uh, in the world, which is that it is a uh, it is a consumer protection. Um, agency that has what we can call five tools, um, supervision, enforcement, rulemaking, research, and financial education, consumer financial education. The FTC obviously does not have supervision. It has limited rulemaking. Um, it does have the, the other aspects uh, of it, but that um, it'll be interesting to see how um, Director Chopra uses that combination of tools. Um, and this is something we write a lot about, which is, for example, our view is is that the relationship between supervision and enforcement at the uh, CFPB isn't clearly defined, right? Or what the role of supervision should be relative to the prudential regulators. Uh, should CFPB be supervising in a different way from uh, the prudential regulators? So I think it'll be interesting to see how he uses those tools. The second thing that you alluded to, Brian, is that based on my experience at the FTC, the interface between competition and consumer protection is very deeply embedded in the um, in the kind of the fabric of the FTC of being aware of unintended consequences of competition from uh, from consumer protection um, ideas, and hopefully that will be brought uh, to the to the CFPB. Dodd Frank makes it clear that competition is a relevant consideration um, uh, for it's 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 on par. Um, it's one of the one of the core missions of the CFPB is to be concerned about competition, um, and so. You know, our goal, I think, our, our hope at the, for the task force would be that will create a, a, a higher elevation. The last thing I'll say is David mentioned that 40 years ago, the uh, or that 50 years ago, the NCCF recommended the creation of something like the uh, the CFPB. Uh, and when we did the task force, we were very aware that we were writing it in the year of a uh, of an election, and we knew we were not just writing it for this year or the potential that the uh, that uh, Director Craniger would continue, but we were writing with an idea of, like the NCCF, of looking 10 or 20 years uh, into the future um, and creating a framework that would be more adaptable, a framework that would be easier to modernize, that would deal with the fact that the world is speeding up and it's accelerating at an accelerating pace. Um, and so we tried to create a framework uh, for how to think about developments over time as uh, markets and consumer preferences uh, uh, change. And so it took 40 years for that recommendation of the NCCF. CCF to uh, to come to uh, to fruition. So hopefully some of our recommendations will uh, take less than forty years, <laughs> uh, uh, and some might never end up coming in at all. But we hope at least it'll be a resource for Director Chopra, assuming he is confirmed, uh, to get up to to kind of get a sense of what uh, what we see at least as the strengths uh, of the current financial system, consumer financial system, and consumer protection framework, as well as areas at least that we thought that um, improvements and modernization could be uh, could be done. Thanks, Todd. David, you get the final word here. So, Brian, to your question, I don't think the pendulum swing serve anybody's interest very well. 
I would say to Director Kraninger's credit, I don't think the pendulum swung that far. Certainly on payday it did, but on many things it was you know a different bureau than it was under Director Cordray, but not uh, not 180 degree, degrees different. I would hope that the bureau is not going to swing uh, radically left and right with with elections. Uh, and I guess last, since this implicates in some ways the question of bureau structure. I came, you know, before I entered in the world, world of consumer finance, I was a, a labor lawyer, a union lawyer. Uh, the National Labor Relations Board has a commission structure, and that structure never has prevented it from swinging uh, fairly dramatically from Republican to Democratic administration and back then. So I don't have any reason to think that a commission structure would somehow temp would temper in very in, in material ways the swings to the extent they occur. I think that. Uh, hopefully, regulators recognize that uh, the stability. There's a value to stability, and people be able to predict what the rules will be, uh, and uh, uh, adjust their behavior accordingly. Thank you both to David and Todd for your participation today. This has been illuminating. Like I said, I wish we had more time uh, to discuss, um, but nonetheless, uh, this was a, a great start to the conversation. So, with that, I will uh, uh, wrap things and turn the mode back over to Colton. Thank you very much. I just want to echo Brian. Uh, we're very grateful to David and Todd for their time today and for the insightful discussion. We welcome listener feedback by email at rtp at regproject.org. Thank you for joining us. This concludes today's call. On behalf of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project, thanks for tuning in to the Fourth Branch Podcast. To catch every new episode when it's released, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spreaker. For the latest from RTP, please visit our website at regproject.org. That's R-E-G project.org. This has been a FedSoc audio production. 